Um, I'm going to talk today about designing with grid. If you're a person who likes to follow along, you can follow along right now. I just tweeted the link to the slides that are on my website. Um, or you can look them up later. There's also lots of links to other resources and such all in one place for you to be able to check out. So how many people have heard of CSS Grid at this point? Quite a lot of people. And how many people have actually written code using CSS Grid? Ooh, that number's going up. Last year it was very different. Uh, so CSS Grid is a specification. It's a CSS specification, which basically means a big technical document that browser makers use to agree with each other about exactly how all the browsers are going to work. It's a giant pile of new properties and superpowers and tools that we're going to use to do layout on the web. And it landed all at once in March. So Firefox the first week of March, Chrome the second week of March, Opera the third week of March, and Safari the fourth week of March. Boom, 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 boom. I think for the first time ever, we're seeing something epic and huge land in almost not quite, kind of, sort of, the, all the browsers all at the same time. Amazing. Um, it's actually been in IE 10 since 2012. Uh, we just didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> The version that's in IE is old. It was the original draft of this particular specification called the grid specification um, because the folks at Microsoft wrote that original draft. Although it was built on a lot of other work that had been done by other people under different names that stretched like way back into infinity when CSS was a baby and we weren't even using it yet. There were still there were ideas being born about how layout would work. It just took forever for them to arrive. Uh, but this is very different than something like, say, Flexbox, where all the construction and the rough drafts and the maybe we'll do it this way. No, wait, never mind. Let's do it this other way. No, let's change it again. With Flexbox, that all happened when we were watching and we were shipping it and we were using it on websites <laughs> because we were, it was all being done with vendor prefixes, this way to sort of start out with rough draft code. Well, the browser makers looked at what we did and what happened with Flexbox and they're like, we're not doing that anymore. We're not using vendor prefix prefixes anymore. That's, that's a bad idea. And they switched to a system where they're able, browser makers are able to um, put a lot of different ideas into the browser and try it out and write code and see if it's working and figure out that it's not and change it 14 times behind a flag, which means that each person who wants those powers to work in their browser has to go and actually turn it on in their individual browser, which means that most people don't, which means we, people who make websites, are not shipping websites with this code. So it's been under construction for five years. It's changed a whole bunch, and you just didn't know it. And now it's done. And now you can use it. And now it's not going to change. And now, you know, there's a couple bugs. There's one of them in Firefox that's been driving me nuts. It's getting fixed next uh, Tuesday. So Tuesday it won't, won't be there anymore. Um, but that's a lot of nerdy information about this technical spec. This talk actually is not going to have much code or really any code in it at all. I don't want to necessarily deep jump straight into how to use Grid. I want to start with why to use Grid, how it's going to affect our designs, what is it that our medium is about, what does this actually mean for the web and for layout. For the longest time, maybe at least the last five years, if not decade, when we say the word Grid, we've met, we kind of have met this. Right? The, this image springs to your head. 12 columns, they're all the same width. That's what a grid is, right? We, so CSS grid is another way to do this. You can do this with CSS grid. Uh, I'm hoping that you might not want to, that there are other things you might want to do instead. Um, and as I wonder about what is it that we're doing, what does this mean for our medium, I think a lot about other artistic mediums, other mass media, and how they evolved over time, how they changed through history. These are stills from a film called The Kiss. It's from 1896. Uh, it, it's thought to be the very first commercial film. It's 18 seconds long. And there are these two actors who pose for a kiss in this film. That's the whole film. It's a kiss, right? It was very controversial because it was a Victorians, and how dare you, you know, show a kiss publicly, especially with faces that are huge. Uh, but it's funny to me watching it now because it kind of feels like the actors sort of pose for a kiss and then they reset themselves and pose again as if they really don't understand that it's a moving image. That they're thinking about it as a photograph and thinking about it as a photograph in 1896 when you had to really sit still if you didn't want it to be blurry. So they're taking ideas out of the older medium and bringing them to the new medium and not really understanding yet what it means to portray a kiss on screen. 
If you fast forward 80 years, you get to one of my favorite TV shows when I was a kid, Little House on the Prairie. It was awesome. Uh, it was innovative, Little House on the Prairie. It won very many, a lot of awards, Emmys for innovative storytelling, innovative camera work. It was one of the first shows to use a steady cam. If you watch that show today, however, it's so slow. You're like, I know what's going to happen. Can it just happen already? I don't have to watch you walk from the house to the barn. I get it. You're in the house. You're in the barn. You walked. I get it. Right? <laughs> There's episodes where like Paul loses his job, and then the next week there's no mention of the fact he lost his job. He's actually back at his old job again. Um, they adopted a kid at one point, and then you never see the kid ever again. <laughs> uh, jump forward another 40 years, and storytelling has changed even more. House of Cards expects that you have watched every frame in order. House of Cards expects that the audience is very sophisticated at understanding what camera work means and what storytelling in that medium means. These things don't stay static. They change co constantly. Our users, our readers, our, our audiences who use our websites or the web apps or whatever it is we're building with web technology, their ideas of how things work are changing very quickly as well. Um, it's not static. Our medium is not done. Layout is not already solved. <laughs> I think we've just begun. So let's take a moment and think about layout on the web. This is how things started. This was it. Every layout look like this, because there were literally no tools for layout. You just had a column of text or whatever. It was just a flow. We just had the flow. You could maybe center things or do right alignment, left alignment. But you know, every website basically looked like this. They also had gray backgrounds. Um, the fact that you could do images was pretty radical. That took a little while to happen. And then uh, tables came along. Tables were invented, invented to be used for what? Oh, data, data tables. Uh, but some graphic designers showed up, and they were like, hmm, tables. Let's do crazy, hacky things, and we'll use the idea with tables that you can place things on the page in different places in a giant table. We'll use that. We'll hack that, and we'll use that for layout. And people were very creative. There are lots of reasons that that was a terrible idea, accessibility being probably the most important, uh, you know, Putting your content together with your styling is a terrible idea, right? Lots of reasons we already know about why we shouldn't use tables to do layout. But you know, those days were so creative. We had a lot of work <laughs> like this. It was very punk rock. It was very, hey, we'll do whatever we have to to get it done. Uh, Microsoft's first home page. We really like circles. Oh my gosh, there's a shape that's not a rectangle. It's called a circle. And there's another one, it's called a triangle. <laughs> like, there's all sorts of work that now, I mean, of course, it's pixelated and it's rough. We only had a few, 216 colors, blah, blah, blah. But in some ways, when I look at this work, I think there's something about the graphic design of this work that's actually better than the work that we do today. That is, in fact, serving the content or serving something else that we lost at some point. Um, Although some of it, ideas came over from CD-ROMs. You can see you know, ideas coming over. Like, it's, What do we do with the web? I don't know. It's like a CD-ROM. It's just on the network, right? Yep, let's do that. Okay. Uh. And then, of course, CSS came along. We realized that we really needed to separate content from our styling and our styling from our behavior. And we have HTML, CSS, JavaScript. I very much believe in those things. Yes, so great. Awesome. Cool. What do we do? Well, floats. Let's use floats. And we'll just. Do <laughs> right. Uh, we got into these ruts with uh, for a lot of reasons, but part of it was that the technology doing floats is, was tricky, especially back in the day when box sizing was handled differently by different browsers, and we were still struggling with IE5, and we needed to make sure that things were working properly across a range of browsers that weren't really doing the same thing as each other, um, and. Somewhere along the way, some very smart folks came along and said, you know what? Well, we know all the browsers, all the, all the monitors are 1024 wide, 1024 pixels wide. And there's a little bit of Chrome in the browser on the edges. So that's, you know, somewhere around 990 is about the max. That's how big our website should be. Let's make the math easy. So let's do 60 pixel columns and 20 pixel gutters. And if we make 12 of them, then that will add up to 960. And then if you want an extra 20 on each side, then that makes 980. Well, that will fit really nicely within 1,000 pixels. Let's do that. Uh, so we all did that. And we did that. And then we went ahead and did that some more. 
Um, and I think that that's really where the origins of this 12 column grid came from. And for reasons that don't really exist very much anymore. Like we don't think that our things should be set in pixels that have nice round numbers. Um, and then of course this happened, right? So this came along, all the screens are not the same size. So what did we do? We took that 960 grid and we made a lot of responsive versions out of it. So a lot of folks here, I'm sure you've used one or another of these tools where it's sort of a squishy, flexible version of oh, the 960 grid. And a lot of like, well, we'll just move the sidebars around, right? Like that's, and, and I think we needed transitions, right? That's what we, we couldn't, responsive was super overwhelming. So yeah, sure, let's just take one step at a time. It's an evolution. We also came along and said, okay, well, what if we uh, break up the page into these zones? That could be some really interesting, I think that's, I still find that fascinating, this idea that there could be panes in a page and you scroll into these panes. Well, but what are we going to do inside each of these panes? Well, we'll just split it in half. We'll do a big hero graphic. We'll do it into a thirds. And so we end up with a lot of this, right? This probably looks very familiar. You probably shipped this website. I know I have. Um, and part of the reason that's happening is because we actually aren't designing layouts these days right now. We're downloading them. We're using something like Twitter Bootstrap or any of the other bazillion tools. We're just sort of downloading a third party layout framework and we're saying, I don't know, we don't have time, we'll just go ahead and use their layouts. And I'm a big believer of starter kits and frameworks. I don't think that we need to open a blank page every time we start a website. You want to lean on the wisdom of others and grab the boilerplate or the starter kit or the base theme and write your code on top of that code, of course. And those of us who are working on many, many projects or on especially folks who work on really big projects, you're frequently working with a giant team and you're you need constraints. You don't want everybody and their brother invent, reinventing typography every time you ship a new feature. You don't want anyone using any color they want because then you end up with 47 buttons of different colors. You have a style guide. You have a framework to implement that style guide. Um, these ideas are really cool and important and they're very hot right now. Lots of people are talking about these ideas. Um, you know, I think it's great. Go ahead, design all this custom. Why do we spend a lot of time and money thinking about branding and how the voice and the tone of a site and how to convey that voice and tone through the, the choices that are made visually? Uh, and then there's a, you know, maybe those pieces are put together into some sort of a card. It feels like the layouts of cards frequently right now are all kind of the same layout. We're a little scared to try something that's even slightly different. I hope that will start to change. Then of course we go, well, you know, we'll lay out, well, we'll just, we need a 12 column grid, right? Uh, and we'll just take our components and jam them onto the grid. And there isn't really very much conversation about this or discussion about this. This is just sort of an assumption. Lots of work going into the detail part and then they just sort of jump into laying them out. Um, and I'm hoping that we will decide over the next year, especially the next two or three years, that the figuring out layouts and coming up with a palette of layouts and coming up with a group of choices that are right for your project or your company, or maybe if you design a lots of websites, then it's sort of your style, the same way you tend to use a lot of the same fonts and different combinations, but and every client's different. But you know what? You kind of go back to the same set of fonts because you really love them. Maybe you have that, you have a set of layouts that you use that you kind of go back to over and over, but they're yours. They're not the one and only thing that everybody in the whole industry is doing. Um, so here's the official timeline <laughs> of web page layouts. Uh, where we went from the low layout layout to the table-based layout to hand-coded layouts to framework layouts. Um, and I really do think that there's an amazing future coming that things are about to change pretty drastically. It takes time, of course. It'll take several years, but that we're, all, we're at this moment where things are going to shift. So why do I think that? I think that because of CSS Grid, but also because of a, a lot of other tools that have just showed up in our toolbox, including Flexbox, Alignment, Writing Modes, Multi-Column, Viewport Units, Transforms, Object Fit, Clip Path, Masking, Shape Outside, Initial Letter. Some of these have been around for several years, although I don't think we're yet using them as much as we could be. Um, and some of them are still to come. Alignment hasn't quite shipped yet, but it's a coming, and there's going to be more tools after that. Plus, we have all of these other tools that have been around for quite a while now that I've been spending a lot of time recently reading the CSS2 specification <laughs> because I realize there's giant holes in my knowledge or giant gaps that I don't quite understand how things work. And I haven't needed to. It's been fine. But now that I really want to understand the future of layout and where we're going, there's some gems back there to really understand how to use a float and why 
because it's a great tool that we should keep using. There's just certain use cases for it. It's not the tool for every single thing ever. Um, or understanding uh, how to use negative margins or, or why to use inline block versus using block or something. Those are all tools that we're going to continue to use. And this is our new set of tools, these, all of these things in combination. We're not going to get rid of Bootstrap and replace it with CSS Grid and just go back to things and all, everything is in the CSS Grid. It's not a contest between these different properties. It's a whole world of properties that we're going to be using together. And this new CSS really does revolutionize page layouts. So I'm going to focus today on CSS Grid because it is so powerful and amazing. Uh, but I want to start talking about the nature of CSS Grid and, and how it's different than what we've been doing, what the frameworks we've been using, and bust some assumptions that we have. So there's this idea in Grid, explicit and implicit. You'll see it all over as you start to learn how to use CSS Grid or you start to understand how to design for it, even if you're not writing any code. Um, this idea that you can explicitly define something or you can not define it, and the browser will implicitly make it up. The browser will start making stuff up for us. So you could define the size and the number of the rows or the columns, or you cannot do that. And you can let the browser decide the size of the columns or the number of the rows or how things, you can combine them. It's, it's not all or nothing. You can end up somewhere in between where you, you define certain things and the browser goes ahead and takes care of the rest of it. You can also place something specifically in a place on the grid. You can say, this header I want in this corner, or this, this piece of content I want over here on the page. Or you can not do that. And you can just say, hey, I got a bunch of stuff. Here it is in my HTML. I've said a few things about my grid. I would like you to go up for it now. And the browser will start placing each of these items. It will be like, this one goes here, and this one goes here, and this one goes here. And it will start laying everything out for you automatically using this thing called the grid auto placement algorithm. So part of understanding how to work with grid as a coder or as a designer, or even as a client, is understanding this interplay between letting the browser do a lot of things versus you doing them. The other thing is that we have rows and columns, which we've never had before. We've had columns. But now we have rows. It's a really big deal. Um, we can break the space up in a horizontal fashion. We can actually place things further down on the page than we have before. Tracks don't have to be all the same size. This has been possible in the past, but it was tricky and hard with the math. And frequently, you had to use some sort of a more powerful tool. There are several SAS frameworks that came along. Uh, but you, now it's super easy. Now it's unbelievably easy to have tracks, columns or rows, that are not the same size as each other, where you end up with some sort of a grid that looks a lot more like this than the 12 column grid that I showed you to start with. You can have content be sized by the size of the space that it's in, the track that it's in. Or you can have a track be sized by the content that's within it. And you can combine these two things together. You might say, for example, that you're going to have a column that's a fixed size, like a 200 pixels or 10 Ms, and just have it always be that size. We can actually combine flexible things with non-flexible things now for the first time. And then have something be the portion of two available space, uh, you know, two parts of the portion of available space, and then one part of the space that's available. And then that last column is going to get its size from the content that's inside it. So maybe in one situation it's skinny, in another situation it's wide. We don't know how, long, how wide it's going to be until the content is in it. This is sort of our new reality, being able to combine these different ways of sizing things together. Also, content doesn't <coughs> have to fill the track that it's in. We've been pretending that we've had columns, but we haven't actually had columns. What we've had is this agreement with ourselves and the code that we've written where we put something someplace and we make it a certain width. I'm going to take this main body text for my blog post and I'm going to make it three columns wide, which just means I'm making it this particular set of pixels wide or this particular number of percents wide. But there wasn't actually a construct there for real. It was simply the content being sized to a certain size. But in the new reality, the 
content, there is actually a space being made, a grid cell being defined. And then you can put content inside that grid cell, but the content doesn't have to be the same size as the cell or the track that it's in. It might be bigger and stick out. It might be smaller and uh, be set somehow in that track or in that cell. And this is where if you're familiar with Flexbox, then you know things like justify content, align content, align items, and you kind of can move things around and we can get vertical centering for the first time. Grid has all these same properties where you can then if your content's smaller than the space that it's in, you can use the justify property to tell it to be against the start edge or against the end edge or in the center. You can use the alignment property to, you know, by default it will be up at the top, but you can actually line everything up along the bottom of the edge of the row that it's in rather than against the top of the row that it's in or vertical centering. So you could have a grid that's like this where you've got content kind of in different places, smaller than the cells, aligned in different ways. It also means that you could have an item, that pink box, for example, is being told to be in a space that's two columns wide and two rows tall, and it's being centered vertically, which means it doesn't actually line up with any of the lines. It's sort of just out in space, you can use things and use grid to line things up, which is if you've studied uh, graphic design history and you know like the work of the Swiss modernists or the mid-century graphic design, things coming out of the Bauhaus, it was like all about lining things up. Everything needed to line up. And we could totally use grid in that way, for sure. But you don't have to. You might use grid to space things out and not really have them be lined up. That's also a possibility. Um, so what are we going to do with CSS Grid? Uh, how the heck are we going to know where to put things? Uh, if we've got all these new possibilities, that's too much work. Like, what, what, I don't want infinite possibilities. I want to know what to do. Uh, I think one thing that is helpful, what I've been doing a lot of myself, is looking at graphic design as a tradition, as a history, as a theory, and grabbing all these ideas out of the 20th century graphic design um, that really was focused on print, whether it was books or posters or other kinds of things. Uh, but there's really good principles there for us to go back and learn and to realize what it is that we, why to put something at one place and not another. Why to line it up or not line it up, for instance. Um, so I'm just going to name a couple principles that I think are important that we don't necessarily think about on the web, or we haven't thought about them directly necessarily, but I think, I think it would be good for us to do that. Um, one of them is visual hierarchy. Uh, we seem to, on the web, always feel like the most important stuff should go in the top left. It's important it goes in the top left. Um, the principle of visual hierarchy says, no, it doesn't have to go in the top left if it's most important. It just needs to be more prominent. It just needs to be bigger. It needs to be bolder. It needs to be stronger. Um, you might have a situation where the first line of text is actually less important than the second line of text. But you use visual hierarchy to guide people's eyes and let them know where it is that they're supposed to go next. Symmetry is a principle talked a lot about in graphic design. You can make things be symmetrical. You can also make them be asymmetrical. <laughs> we love symmetry on the web, just like the Victorians did. Uh, we are scared of asymmetry for some reason. Um, I think asymmetry can really bring a lot of fresh perspective, a lot of attention to your designs in a world where it's very hard to get people's attention. Um, Symmetry, everything's very symmetrical on the web. We could instead make it asymmetrical. Slight differences. I'm not talking about being crazy and making layouts that people have no idea where anything is. I'm talking about slight differences that can have a big impact. Proximity is another principle, another idea that's fascinating to me. It has to do with the way our brains work, where when you put a bunch of things together, people, without thinking about it subconsciously, they associate them as a group. And if you separate them and you make two groups, people see them as two groups, when they might not actually be two groups. Or maybe they are, or maybe they. So there's a way in which proximity is used to create meaning and to create association. And we want to be careful with that. As we begin to add more space to our layouts, we want to think about proximity as a way to understand what we're doing. Another one is density. Uh, right now on the web, everything is super, super, super duper dense. Although I am seeing some work where things are not so dense, like the new Hulu app on the TV. You only ever get one TV show inside the screen. Or as we've made things, we've gotten rid of a lot of the cruft in the sidebar, and we've made things bigger and bigger, and we've made websites be quieter. 
we've actually hit this point at which things are so big that you almost don't have enough information density. So there becomes this question of when is density good, when do we want density, and when do we maybe not want so much density? When do we want to spread things out? How do we make sure that we haven't gone one way too far or the other? We've been just being super duper dense all the time uh, for reasons because of floats. With floats, floats are almost like having a giant bathtub full of bars of soap. And responsive design is just like a bathtub that's squishy and the <laughs> bars just, like all the bars just rearrange themselves. Everything has to float to the top of the screen. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be that way now that we have CSS Grid. Somebody's driving us somewhere. <laughs> uh, I love this quote from Platon. He's a famous photographer and he said, my deep respect for the form and for form in positive and negative space comes from studying Frank Lloyd Wright's idea of compression and expansion. You walk into a Frank Lloyd Wright building and the entranceway is so small it almost makes you dip your head. And then as soon as you walk into the main room, he blows up the space and it makes you feel like, oh, that's so good. This is a photographer studying architecture to better understand uh, positive and negative space, compression and expansion to take those ideas into his photography, right? I think we can start doing that more, not start, but we can be doing that on the web where we think about density and expansion and contraction and get ideas from other places, from other mediums. So I do think it's time to bring graphic design onto the web and figure out what does it mean to have graphic design ideas on the web. I also think that it's time we're ready, in a way, as a medium to have our own theory, to have our own principles, to understand the web in the way that it's different from every other medium, and understand what is it about design on the web that's, that's of the web itself, and be able to have conversations more directly about how to handle this medium as we uh, go into the future and we understand how to do layout. So I have a bunch of examples. Um, I'm going to show you some of them, but there's many, many, many more. They're all at labs.jensimmons.com. I'd love for you to check them out. And you can dig into the code. If you see anything today, you can definitely go check it out and dig into the code and see how it is that I built it. Um, even, you know, bar the code, go use it on another project. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I have discovered in six parts. Part one, overlap. Overlapping is something you'll see quite a lot. Uh, outside the web, Mag magazines, for example, to have a little headline that overlaps a photo, kind of sticks out and overlaps it. Um, we have not been doing that on the web because it's been impossible. You maybe could use absolute positioning, but then nothing takes up space, and you're like, oh, this is too much work. Like, it was just not worth it. Grid makes it super easy to overlap things. So there's an example um, at that address where I've overlapped these three different boxes by using grid and placing them explicitly on the grid in specific particular places. I'm showing you here, by the way, there's a tool in Firefox, it's only in Firefox, where it says display grid, there's like a little waffle icon, and you click on that waffle, and it brings up the lines on the page. And it makes it far easier to understand what you're doing and far easier, easier to learn grid because you can see the lines. Before we had any tools to be able to do this, there were a bunch of us trying to learn grid and it was much harder, believe me. Um, so crack open Firefox and go find the little waffle and click on the waffle. Um, there's also a tool coming out. It will be in nightly next Thursday, I think. There's an entire new panel, um, a layout panel. So we see where it says rules, computed, animation, fonts. There's going to be one that says layout. And there's going to be a whole bunch of powers in there to um, mess around with grid. Um, so definitely check out these tools. Uh, here's another just brief example of a bunch of translucent circles that I've overlapped. I've just stolen this idea right off of a poster from the 19 mid-century, last century. Um, and there's the grid. You can see kind of how I put that together. Here's what could be a teaser card, right, with overlap with a slightly different layout. It's not so crazy that people are confused, but you could have a layout like this that just makes it feel like, hey, I know, you know, this, this, I get the, the tone of the site. There's something interesting here because it's quite a little different than what I'm used to seeing. Um, and that's a totally responsive layout. You can check that one out. This is an Italian poster that I, I just keep seeing things everywhere. I, keep, I crack open a book, I see something that I want to lay out with grid, and then I just see whether or not I can do it. 
Uh, not because I'm going to use these ideas in particular directly on a project, but because it's helping me learn grid, it's helping me expand my imagination and understand what it is that we can be doing. So overlap, simple principle, but I do think it's a big deal. We could start using it quite a lot uh, now that we have grid. The viewport. So we talk a lot about viewport when we think about media queries or maybe viewport units, but we haven't really thought about, I, ha I think we could really spend more energy thinking about the viewport itself and what it means to have a viewport, what it means to work in a medium that has a viewport. When I was in Berlin last year, there's lots of posters everywhere on the walls. Um, and I used to do tons of print design. I've designed more posters than I can count. The job of these posters, at first, is to make you turn your head right, and look at them. And they're there together as a, in, a, in a group on the wall because as, as a group, they're more likely to get, you know, they're working together to get you to turn the, your head. And then the moment you turn your head, they're competing with each other to get you to look at them. Look at me. And if you then walk a little bit closer, if they succeed and you walk a little closer, then visual hierarchy kicks in and you're looking at certain parts of the poster. And then you, as you get more interested, maybe you're looking at more details and you realize, actually, I do want to go to this music festival. Where, how much are the tickets and who's good else is going to be there? And what days of the, of the week are they? Um, there's a way in which you're far away and then you get closer. But the entire time, you see the whole poster. The whole thing is visible. Your eye could go to any part of the page whatsoever. I, uh, I saw this poster in a book. It's a Jazz at Lincoln Center poster from 2007. You notice that the logo is down in the bottom corner. The title is not all the way at the very top of the page. Oh my god, the title's not at the top of the page. Um, and there's this feeling of jazz from these pink boxes, but they are fairly square. They are fairly like mechanical in a way. And you can see the entire photo of uh, Winston Marsal is playing the um, trumpet, right? When I saw this, I went, oh my gosh, can I lay that out in grid? I had just been, I just started learning grid. And so then I did. I put it into a web page. And I literally translated the poster over, which is crazy, because like the logo's in the bottom corner. Like that's not where the logo needs to be. The logo needs to be someplace where it shows up when you first look at the page. Um, I think that the boxes aren't quite as mechanical in this fashion. As they scroll past, they feel more like jazz notes. And there's something really interesting about seeing the top of Winston Marcellus's head and then slowly having the trumpet unveil itself as you scroll. So there's certain ways in which I think this design is better in the viewport. And then there are other ways in which it doesn't work at all. That in order to really turn this into a web page, to honor the spirit and the technique and the, what the poster was doing, I would need to start changing it. But the very fact that we're seeing it through time, through a viewport, is part of what it means to be doing layout on the web. We understand this as users, right? I mean, how many of you kind of have muscle memory of exactly how far down the customer reviews are on the Amazon <laughs> page, right? Like, you're just like, blah, 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 boo, it reviews. But how many of you have a mental model in your head that this is what Amazon.com is, right? <laughs> No one, no one has the mental model that this is what it looks like. And yet, when we work together frequently, what do we do? We email each other PDFs. But when was the last time that you emailed or received an emailed PDF that was this aspect ratio, that was this skinny and tall? We pretend like our pages are not this tall. We pretend like there's something more like this tall, right? We email PDFs that look like this, or like these are actual literally PDFs that I was emailed when I was working as a front-end developer. Look how short those pages are. I guarantee you that the final website was never that short. So we have this kind of weird confusion. We think it's short, but it's not. But we, and when we do we'll go ahead and, you know, sh should we be making taller PDFs? Like maybe, maybe at times we should be. But how is it, it's not really a, P, you know, we're, we're this, this is our experience for our users. So how is it that we maybe could start to use a tooling process and a design process and a conversation so that we can think more carefully about this experience and not the giant PDF experience. And as I think about this, I've thought, you know what, we're not the only industry that's had this problem. The other industry that's had this problem is filmmaking. And how do they solve this problem, especially before computers came along and pre-visualization software and all that stuff? They solved it with storyboards. So they could sit down when you know, the money running meter was like cheap and not the money running meter is like millions of dollars a day. 
And they could think through all the camera shots. They could think through what lenses do we need. They could think through how are we going to set this up. They could think through how many shots is it that we need in order to tell the story that we want to tell. Now, they were not doing pixel-perfect drawings of every single frame of the entire film. No one got confused. No one showed up on set and held up the storyboard and went, hmm, that doesn't quite look the way that we planned it. So we need to move the camera over four feet in order to right? Who cares? The storyboard is, is a part of the process. What mattered was the actual shot, the actual filmmaking. Um, and I think that's maybe one thing that we could be doing. We could be drawing some storyboards. I think that's part of the reason that we get so obsessed about the above the fold, because it's very easy to think about above the fold and what fits or doesn't fit within that particular space. But we should be thinking about that all the way down the page. We should be thinking about if you scroll through a newspaper article and you get halfway through and there's a data visualization, what does it mean for that data visualization to fit onto the screen or not fit onto the screen? Maybe you want to use different kinds of technology to make that responsive both vertically and horizontally in order to respond to the size of that viewport. Um, just ideas. Uh, how is it that we might you know, sketch something out or draw it? And we're not drawing phone, tablet, we're drawing like a, a, a storyboard of a moment of what it would be like for users. Um, and then that may be a way for us to communicate with each other before we get into the browsers, before we get to prototyping, as well as, as also just prototyping designs. In this design, you can see here that no matter what size the screen is, four panes or four teaser cards always fit into the viewport, that the size of the content is, is morphing depending on the size of the viewport. And I'm accomplishing that with grid having rows and columns with alignment properties and with viewport units, uh, taking some of these new tools and making it so that the actual content can respond to the viewport. We've been saying this whole time, oh, there's no fold. There's no such thing as above the fold. Actually, that's not true. There is a fold. <laughs> there is a bottom edge. There now, we can, for a long time, we only paid attention to the top and the left edges. And we pretended like the right edge, we always knew where it was when really we didn't. And then with responsive web design, we finally realized, oh, we need to go ahead and, go and, and, and adjust to the two side edges. But we've been ignoring the bottom edge. I think we can finally go ahead and start paying attention to the bottom edge and think about the whole frame. Here's an example. So uh, I'm a huge fan of Michael Pollan. His website right now is not responsive. If you go to it, it's sort of like that first example that I showed you. Um, and then the responsive, if I were to redesign it and I wanted to make it responsive for him, you know, a la Ethan Marcotte, a la the last five years, you know, it would be like this, right? So it would fit this direction, but really the height of the thing wouldn't make any difference. But then, using this newest technology, I can actually go ahead and make it so that the house gets smaller, right? The whole thing fits on the screen or, or you know, whatever it is that I'm attempting to do, that that, that actually works in the space that's available. Um, right, there's lots of possibilities. Here's another kind of experiment that I put up where, uh, you know, two different ways in which the content kind of changes size based on the spaces that are available. Um, just messing around. I don't really know what this means, but just messing around to see what it is that's possible. So how is it that I did that? Well, it's by using viewport units and by saying, hey, I want this box to be 50% of the height of the viewport and to be 50% of the width of the viewport. And then I want you to place it so that it's centered vertically and justified to the left. Or here, that circle, I've said I want that circle to be 50 V min, which means 50% of the minimum size. So height, it looks at height and width. It takes whichever one is smaller, and then it makes it 50% of that size. And just another way to play around. The viewport, we've got this frame. The first time I ever shot a film on 16 millimeter film, I shot it on a Bolex camera. And I remember picking up the Bolex camera. And I had used video cameras before. But the, the, especially the, those 16 millimeter cameras, the real film film cameras, it was like looking through the world, like holding up a toilet paper tube to my eye. And I had an assignment to tell this story in four, uh, two and a quarter minutes. And I was like, how do I tell a story by looking through this toilet paper tube? <laughs> like, how in the world am I going to fit? I, you know, I think especially with phones, we're used to these super wide angle lenses where you're looking at this wide angle and you're sort of telling. That's why these phones have wide angle lenses, right? But if you want to tell a story through a, a, a more professional lens, through a narrow lens, it's really quite a feat to understand how to stage everything to make it fit. Um, 
framing. And framing, in, you know, in the 1890s up to the 1910s, they spent a lot of time talking about when do we want to use a close-up? When do we want to use a wide shot? Why? What does it mean? How does, that, how, does, how, does the audience, how does the audience feel differently when we choose to use one or the other? Um, and then, you know, 100 years have gone by. There's this course called the Master Course put out by Hollywood Camera Work that is uh, really complicated. I mean, things have gotten super duper, super duper complicated with camera moves and what everything means. Uh, I wanted to show you a clip from it because I think it's just an interesting taste into what it's like to start to understand a medium in the way that, I mean, they, they're 100 years ahead of us, right? So they have the sophisticated understanding of what things do. And I think we could start going in that direction as well. So. The close push is one of the most useful and expressive moves we can do, and there are good reasons to use it in most scenes. It's tempting to do slow pushes as often as possible because of the production value, but it's when we stick to motivated pushes that we bring out the story. Most people choose when to push intuitively, but we'll try to put words to that by suggesting that close pushes are for meaningful moments. Most of what goes on in this scene is, of course, not a meaningful moment. Here the red man is talking about something that has no meaning at all, maybe the pizza he had for lunch. But let's do a close push anyway. As he talks about the double cheese crust and the extra layer of pepperoni, the push assigns meaning to the situation, even if there isn't any. But a close push is extremely powerful when we intend to show that something is meaning. As we push in on the man, we know that whatever's happening has special meaning, something is important or significant, or that something is going on, even if we don't know what it is. This by itself is a great use for the close push, because it creates questions of participation, and it tells us we need to pay extra attention. Fascinating, right? There's a filmic language, and you go to film school that you start to learn it. There's, I think, a webic language. There's some sort of language of the web of what these things mean or what these choices mean. And, and I think it's going to be interesting to start slowly together over you know, decades figuring out what that is and being able to articulate it and use it with a bit more skill. What does it mean to have a reading experience with a frame where things move in and out of a frame? Or to have an interaction experience, some sort of an app experience. What does it mean to have things move in and out of a frame? A lot of apps, I mean, in some ways, people, the idea, what's the difference between an app and a site? Oh, a site scrolls this way, and an app scrolls this way. Like, what does that mean? We can make a site scroll this way. You can make an app scroll this way. So users have this vocabulary that they're used to both in certain situations. How is it that we might want to play with those things? How could they serve us? How could we leverage them? to get our work done better, to do a better job of the things we're trying to accomplish. So the viewport. I think there's a lot to think about with the viewport and what it means for us. White space. You might have heard, seen me hinting about this. White space. We can have white space because we have rows. We can place things all over the place. We don't have to have everything crammed up against the top of the page. It really was very hard before. It was very fragile, especially in a responsive situation. You couldn't really control what was going on enough to be able to keep it from turning into utter chaos. That's all changed. So what does it mean to use white space? Um, Leila and Massimo Vanelli are very famous graphic designers that worked in New York City in the mid to late 20th century. And they're very famous for their particular understanding and interpretation of how to use the grid in graphic design. They said about the grid. Great designs can be achieved without the use of the grid, but the grid is a very useful tool to guarantee results. Ultimately, the most important tool is the management of white space and layouts. It's the white space that makes the layout sing. Bad layouts have no space left for breathing. Every little space is covered by a cacophony of type sizes, images, and screaming titles. Sound familiar? Right? So what does it mean to uh, use white space? There's a whole history, actually, of these early mid-century, 20th century folks um, that I've been diving into and making all sorts of layouts with grid like this, just ripping them off, <laughs> making everything responsive, responsive Mondrian. Like, what would it mean to do a layout of teaser cards that was something more like this? 
than the sort of one, 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 one that we're used to. Um, there's a ton of books out there. There's a whole world of ideas about how to use a grid, why to use a grid. Um, some of them are quite uh, fascist, actually. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally, some of them are fascists. Um, so I think there's a way in which we, I don't, I'm not really in the mood to adopt their uh, must do it this way, this must use Futura, the only font to use is Futura, <laughs> must use this color red, the only, women don't belong in society, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like there's, there's some manifestos out there that I'm just like, oh man. Uh, but there are these ideas about the grid and how to use the grid and this, you know, these ideas about how to like proportion space on the page, and then make everything line up inside those proportions, and then as you do your designs, make everything line up on those designs. Um, and so I was curious. I'm like, you know, what, what is it that we could use from these ideas? What is it that we agree with? Um, can we control the size of the page the way that they did and think about, you know, exactly how big the piece of paper is? No, we can't. So we got to, you know, we can't pretend that we do. Um, can we line things up in a way that has been super tricky for us on the web? Yes, these new tools mean we can line things up in a much better way. Uh, can we create white space? Yes, white space, awesome. Can we maintain the aspect ratios of the cells or what they called modules, the grid cells, the grid modules? No, no. So a lot of those principles are all dependent on this idea that you very carefully decide on a mathematical ratio for your grid and then you maintain that everywhere. And we, we don't have the tools yet to do that. I'm hoping we actually can get an aspect ratio property and an aspect ratio unit that would allow us to do that, because there's some designs that I know we're going to want to do, but we can't do it yet. So, But meanwhile, I thought, let me, let me just set aside my aversion to uh, people who are very bossy and see what happens. What if I take this layout and put it into a web page? Um, so I did. It's at that URL. Uh, and I kind of, this is the sort of the grid lines over top of it and how I lined everything up. Um, and this is what it looks like. So in some ways it's kind of interesting and beautiful. Like the way that the text lines up with the next set of photographs and there's sort of an unknown amount of white space. That's interesting. Maybe there's something there. Although in a responsive context with content management systems and unknown amounts of content, you start to hit up with the problems, right? So the line lengths are too long, and then, oh, right. Crashing things, crashing into each other, right? So there's some stuff. Are we going to be able to grid like a modernist? I don't know. Maybe, sometimes, depends on the content. Um, but we're not going to look to them and have them tell us what to do. Grid, CSS grid is not a solution to their problems. <laughs> it's a solution to our problems. Um, but meanwhile, white space. I think white space can be very interesting. We can do interesting things with white space. So verticality, um, you know, like I said, these guys, especially this, uh, this photo to me just epitomizes this idea that there's one way to do graphic design, and it's by listening to these folks that look like this. <laughs> uh, or, you know, but, you know, this is the map, like, <laughs> look at this map of the world and how wrong it is. <laughs> Right? There's an entire other world out there, a much, much bigger world. And I've been really looking for resources in English because that's the only language that I understand to learn graphic design and layout ideas from other parts of the world. Um, there's some really beautiful work and some really interesting ideas that I think we can snatch from all over the place. Um, and I, that, I especially think about that when I'm thinking about verticality because we have such a vertical medium and we are not the first people to be in a situation where we're trying to design in vertical contexts. So if you look to Asia and you look to a lot of work where text was laid out in a, in a vertical line, vertical text, um, rather than horizontally laid out, uh, there's a lot of interesting ideas out there um, that I've been collecting. Ideas about how maybe to, to use a vertical space that's stretched out more, or how to mix some of those things together with uh, more modern ideas here or to mix it together with horizontal text, but sort of vertical lines. Um, how is it that we might want to do that? There's some really particular ideas in Japan, especially about how to use a grid, how to use a line grid. And these ideas are heavily influenced by the, by the mo European modernists and such. I mean, this has always been a global back and forth and sharing. Um, but there's some really interesting ideas if we were going to start to get really rigid in, about rules and grids, we might as well 
get as rigid about Japan's ideas as we do about Switzerland's ideas. Um, or these photographs, I think these are just beautiful photographs of like, what does it mean to put rectangles in a vertical space? That's what we're going to be doing. We put rectangles in vertical spaces. Uh, so I just, I've just begun playing around. I have an example that I built um, just to see, like, these are just random rectangles in a vertical space with tons of white space, but how might we better stretch things out? People scroll. They do scroll. We no longer have the era of that mouse. Remember that mouse with the, like, the little clicky plastic wheel and your finger would get tired of scrolling? Or before that, you, you had to actually like, go find the little down arrow and click it over and over and over and over. Right? Those days are over. We're gliding our fingers on glass, whether it's on the phone screen or whether it's on the trackpad on your laptop. That's a piece of glass. You're just like gliding fingers over glass. The gliding on top of the magic mouse, you're gliding over glass. So it's easier than ever for people to scroll. So how might we be using that space? Um, verticality. I think, it's, I think there's something there that I don't have answers yet, but there's something there to be unlocked about what it means to do layouts in the new era. And then uh, flexibility. So here's an example, right? This beautiful poster. It's a modernist poster, really interesting. It's using Helvetica, I believe. Um, what would we do if we want to make this into a web page? How could I translate that into something that's responsive or squishy, something that's flexible? Uh, I've been having a lot of fun taking kind of static work and trying to figure out how we might want to make it responsive. And what we've been doing, you know, we're all familiar so far. We've, for a long time, we, everything was set in pixels, and then we're setting things in pixels and M's, or that, oh, RAMs, we like RAMs even better. And, uh, with responsive web design, with Ethan Marcotte's definition of how to do things, it's, it's about switching over everything into percents, right? We've been using percents a lot. I have a feeling that we're going to be using the percent unit far less than we have. We're actually going to start using the fixed pixel numbers way more than we have been, or maybe M's and REMs. Um, and then we're going to start, start using these other kinds. Of, we're going to combine them together in these interesting ways, and we're going to start using these other units, or these other ways to set sizes. So there's three, four that I'm going <laughs> to tell you about today. Min content, max content, FR, and min max. They're cool and weird and awesome and mind-bending. And not that hard, but like, what? Uh, <laughs> so here's another famous person work poster, right? I saw this in a book. I took a photo. I'm like, how do I make a grid out of that? Uh, really quick, did a sketch. Like, how? OK, there's some lines. These are the lines that I need. Uh, so how is it that I'm going to size everything? I mean, if you notice that. This third column line is right on the edge of the name, and that's also how the black box gets its size. But the second column line is on the edge of these other pieces of type, right? And things kind of all line up, right? The, that phrase free entry is, the, is lined up on both edges, right? So how do you accomplish that without making it fixed and without making it you know, I want a situation that's going to work responsively and that where if the length of the content changes, it's going to be fine. So here I uh, made, there it is in a web page. Um, so what I did is I used the sizing of max content on that second track so that it will have the beginning and the end always be uh, the beginning and the end of that phrase, free entry in German. So what the heck is max content? So if you have a phrase of words, and you put them into a box that has a certain size, if there are enough words, they'll just go ahead and uh, wrap. We know that. But if you instead say, let's just stretch them out to be completely long, a whole long, what's the maximum length that that content would be? No extra space, but just what's the length of that content if you stretched it all the way out? That's max content when you're thinking about text. Or min content is if you take it and make it, it's, small as you possibly can, where it wraps as much as it could possibly wrap, but you're not going to end up with overflow. You're not going to make the box too small so the words stick out. You're going to actually go ahead and keep the box to be big enough that the text fits inside that box. So that's the min content with text. Max content is as big as it's going to be, but no bigger, and min content is as small as it's going to be, but no smaller. Right? So if I set that track size to be max content, then that's how I'll get that result that I'm looking for. And then if I set the first track, the first column track, to also be max content, then I get the result that I want for the first two tracks because 
the browser looks at both of them and it says, well, if this is max content and this is max content, then I'm going to get my sizing from the total, the whole thing. And then that last content, that last column, I sent it to min content. So it would be as small as it possibly could without having any overflow. And then I set this middle track to be 1FR. Um, and then that gives me this result where, uh, you know, which may or may not be the best design ever. There's probably some tweaks that I would need to want to make. But without any media queries at all, this is kind of what's starting to happen. I get a lot of different sizes where the layout works pretty well and it honors the original idea of the design. And you can see here, like if I make the name much, much, much longer, it just holds together. It's not fragile. Things don't fall apart. So I tossed in there an FR unit. So what the heck is an FR unit? Um, so let me explain this to you. It it's, it's, can be seen as an, as an abbreviation of fraction. So let's say you want to have three boxes, simple, known layout. You want the three boxes to be the same size. So how have we been doing that in a responsive world? Well, we've been saying, OK, we put percents on it. We've got three of them. They're going to all be 33%, right? Oh, except it's not really 33%. It's 33.33333%. Uh, oh, except we need gaps. This has no gaps. So OK, two, we'll make a 2% gap. Uh, so what's the math? Like, get out seventh grade math. Um, be like, okay, 32%. Well, that works out pretty well. But those gaps are really small, especially on small screens. They're kind of too small. So maybe, all right, I got to do it with 3%. Do the math again, 31.333%. Yeah, but that's actually too wide, right? So 2.5%. Let me do it again. 3.31.666. Look at the number of the devil. Like, what is going? <laughs> Uh, and really, I don't want percent column, the gaps. I don't want the gaps to be set in, in percents. I want the gaps to be set in Ms. I want it to sort of be the same size all the time. So how do I do that math? Well, I can't do that math ahead of time because I don't know how wide the thing is. So I've got to use calc. So let's use calc. Uh, there's my formula. But that's the formula for if it only works if I have three columns. But really, this is responsive. I also am going to have two columns and four columns and five columns. And <laughs> And all we're trying to do is lay out three boxes. So what has been our solution? Bootstrap that. <laughs> right? That is why we've been using Bootstrap. That is why we've been reaching for these third-party frameworks, because it's just been too hard. It's not been worth doing that by hand. Yeah, well, guess what? Now you can say 1FR, 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 and the browser goes, I know what that means. <laughs> That means I'm going to add up how many ever FRs there are. I'm going to look at how much space I've got. And I'm going to do some fractional math and proportion the space out. And it doesn't matter how many columns there are. As the column, number of columns changes, it's fine. Like, boom, oh, we're going to do it again for four. You know what? It turns out computers are really good at doing math. <laughs> <laughs> and the FR unit lets us let the computer do the work and not us. Um, and this is why we can then mix things together. We can have a 100 pixel fixed column with some flexible columns that are set in FR units. And this is why I don't think we're going to be using percents very much anymore, because I don't even want to use percents. I, maybe there's a reason I would need a 20% column or something. Maybe, maybe. There could be some situations. But I think for the most common situations, we're just going to use FR units. Um, so here's an example, right? I could make the first bit be 50 pixels, and then 2FR, 1FR, 1FR, and then the last would be min content. So it becomes the size it needs to be for whatever ads are in that right rail, right? Everything else kind of gets spread around. Um, or we could do 1FR, 6FR, 2.4FR, 2.4FR, and 2FR, and suddenly we've got a ratio-based array, the kind of thing that Mark Bolton has been talking about for years. And he put a lot of examples up at um, gridsetapp.com that you can check out where he took, for example, he's just doing kind of a blog post layout, but he's doing the layout based on the grids that were used by um, Penguin Books, this sort of very famous graphic design project um, where they created a layout template system for Penguin Books, paperback books, when kind of that wasn't a thing before that. Um, and they used ratio-based array. So he used the same ratio-based array to do a blog layout and get kind of a different effect. And you might be thinking, well, does that really matter? It turns out that it actually really can matter. These are two different layouts that are part of an article that Nathan Ford wrote on the list of part where the first layout is six columns that are all the same size, and the other layout is six columns that are all different sizes from each other, and they're based on some sort of a ratio. And it feels different. It's got a different voice and tone. And at this point, the example that's sort of on the 
symmetrical grid is so trite. It feels boring and it feels very familiar. It feels like you've already been to this website and you already know that you don't like any of this stuff. Or anything. And this other one, for a very simple, very small tweak, has a kind of freshness to it that you, you know, of course, readers aren't, or users aren't going to know, know why, but there is a sort of a sense of like, hey, oh, yeah, I like this. this is something maybe, you know, it's interesting. And FR units make that super s simple and easy. And to play around, you can even play around in the browser. You don't have to actually um, have it all figured out ahead of time. You can just play in the browser until you hit upon something that you like. And then the other thing I wanted to tell you about is min-max. So min-max, uh, here's an, an example of min-max in, in action, where, uh, right, so here's a classic. All the boxes are the same size, and we've got a whole bunch of different, right? If you've, done, if you've written code, you've written CSS, and you've done this with media queries and percents, then you're familiar with how this is done. It's quite a bit of code. Uh, in grid, it is two lines of code. That entire layout was accomplished with two lines of code. There's a container, and then there are items. I've said nothing about the items. I've not told the items where to go. They're getting placed automatically. I've not said anything about the size of the items. They're just becoming the size of the container that they're in, this, the cell that they're in. Uh, and then the container, the outer container, I put display grid on it to trigger a grid formatting context. And then I say grid template columns repeat which means, hey, I, I'm going to have a repeating pattern for you. Get ready. Here we go. I'm repeating. Do what I'm telling you to do. Auto fit, which means, hey, I don't know how many columns to make or how many times to repeat this pattern. Uh, you could put a number there like four, and it would repeat the pattern four times. But in this case, I'm saying auto fit. I'm saying, you, I don't know, you, you figure out what fits. You automatically figure out what fits. And then I'm saying, here's the size that I want each of these columns to be. I want it to be a minimum of 100 pixels wide and a maximum of one FR. And so let's say there's 299 pixels of space total in the container, and they're each supposed to be a minimum of 100. So it goes, OK, I can fit two of them, 100, 100, oh, 99. That's not, that's not enough space. So I, I'm going to fit two of them, but I'm going to make them one FR each. So they're each going to fill up half of the space. And then, OK, ooh, 300, cool. I'm going to squish this back down to 100, and now I can jam a third 100 track there. Now I've got three of, 100, of a minimum of 100, and then I'll let those grow until I get to 400, and then I'll add another one. I'll get to, right? No media queries. Um, it's pretty awesome. It makes things that have been really hard much easier, which then frees up energy. It frees up time to start to venture into these more interesting, these newer spaces. Here's an example where I've kind of combined a bunch of different uh, ways to measure the columns and put them together. That first column is 100 pixels, 1 FR, 1 FR. I got a min max. In this case, there's no repeating or anything. I've just said I want it to be a minimum of 40 characters and a maximum of 65 characters. And then the last column is going to be 1 FR. So let's see what happens. The one FR tracks get smaller and smaller. The fixed pixel track is going to always stay the same size. But this track, the min max track, doesn't actually start collapsing until after the one FR tracks have finished collapsing. So the responsiveness sort of happens in two stages. The empty space disappears until there's really not enough space, and then the text gets, starts getting smaller. And this really surprised me. Reading the grid specification, I wouldn't have known that this was possible, but by, by actually coding up some examples and just throwing, I don't know what this does, let me see what happens. I was like, oh my gosh, this changes everything. Because you end up with responsive world, meaning like it might, you might end up having several stages of flexibility without even including, maybe we could add media queries to this, but there aren't, well, there is actually one media query. But in the larger design, there isn't any media queries there. Like, so have sort of stages of flexibility, ways in which the flexibility um, works differently at different places. I feel like this really finishes off the idea of pixel perfect and of designing a pixel perfect design. Because we're not designing exactly how many pixels there are at certain places. What we're doing is we're designing what happens when part of the content or the interface are missing or when the content or the interface is shorter or longer than ideal. We're defining programmatically how we want the layout to handle the situation that the content is or the interface is giving 
to the, in, in the size of the viewport and everything. And we're designing a model for the flexibility. We're really designing a, a you know, multi-dimensional creature that's, whose job is to do layout. We're not designing exactly where every pixel goes. So flexibility, um, understanding flexibility, understanding what to do with it, understanding why, of course, starting super simple. But eventually, I think the industry will start to get very sophisticated with these things. And then lastly, I feel like it's just simply a time to be creative. It's a time to mess around and to not worry about what other people think of the right way or the wrong way to do things. Um, I don't think there is a right or wrong way right now. I think we actually have absolutely no clue <laughs> as to what's the best way or the not the best way with some of these techniques or some of these decisions about when to use FR or when to use min-max or when to... I think it's time to just play around with it. Um, I've been looking a lot about, uh, at 90s web design. There's a, tw there's a bot on Twitter that just tweets out screenshots from uh, archive.org randomly. And this one came across my feed one day, and I was like, ooh, now you can land new customers. Gosh, that's the kind of thing we used to always do, and then that's the kind of thing that we told each other to never, never do. I wonder if it's still bad. <laughs> Like, if I wanted to do that, could I do it in a way that's super accessible, super, super, you know, not fragile? Um, so I, I laid that out using grid. I put a little, I put those words inside, each word is inside a span so that I could apply a, a grid to just that particular sentence and see what happens. And then I, I saw that navigation. I'm like, oh my gosh. Instead of being like word, 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 it's word, 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 word. <laughs> Oh, that's super practical. You could use that. It's not so weird that users get confused, but it's just different enough that it adds some sort of voice to the situation. Let me see, how would I lay that out in grid? So I applied a grid to that. You don't have one grid for your whole page. You apply a grid to a particular container that you have. So I put a grid on that particular thing. And then I'm like, well, I'm already halfway in. Let me just go ahead and do the whole page. Uh, so I laid out the rest of the header is a grid. So there's a grid. The, the navigation is nested inside of the grid. That's the larger header. And then I did a layout for the whole thing. I had to go get myself a balloon graphic and separate the because the original, of course, the the words and the balloon are, were put together in probably in a well, if not Photoshop, then the other one, fireworks, right? So maybe we open up fireworks and they had to like slice it into pieces. And I'm like, ah, oh, let me make that again. Get the that the sentence is a real sentence and. Um, yeah, like what can we do using good semantic, proper accessibility, modern techniques, but be more creative, be more interesting. So here are the six things I talked about. Overlap, the viewport, white space, fle verticality, flexibility, creativity, just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it really is a time to play. It's a time to learn. It's a time to kind of spend some time learning CSS Grid. The good news is, unlike learning a new, different framework, this knowledge will never go out of date. <laughs> You might put a lot of time into learning uh, React, and eventually React won't be the new hot thing. You may have put a lot of time into learning Bootstrap, and maybe soon those skills aren't going to be needed as much. But you put time into learning CSS, that will last forever. Layout Land is a website. I'm going to be working on this. I keep saying I'm about to work on it any minute, but the truth is it's going to be the fall before I get to it. But I'm going to build a site where we can uh, play around together, where we can have experiments together, where you can go and look at other people's experiments, where there'll be challenges, and you can sort of take the challenge and put out the thing. A bit like uh, Zen Garden, in the way that we learned from each other and we got to actually see what was possible from CSS Zen Garden. Um, I want it to be like that, but also more like just sort of everybody gets to participate. Um, like I said, labs.gensummons.com, all these examples are up. Like I, I also, I didn't teach you all of the code. I need like, um, I don't know, five or six more hours to get into that. <laughs> Uh, but, but you can start to look at it by you know, using the inspector and diving in and seeing how things were put together. Um, I also have two more talks, one from last year and one from the year before, where I talk more extensively about viewport units and things like initial letter to, to do drop caps and lots of other bits and pieces of the CSS that we have available to us now. And there's a post, if you want to learn more about Grid, I've put a long list of my best recommendations into this post. It's actually right on, if you go to my Twitter feed, it's the pinned tweet is a link to this post, or you can find it at this URL. Um, learn CSS Grid, and I've got a bunch of resources, including practical resources, links to uh, 
Rachel Andrew wrote a really great blog post about that IE implementation and the Edge, current, current, currently what's in Edge, that old 2012 version of Grid, so you can think about whether or not you want to use it um, and how to make sure you do or don't use it. Uh, what to do about older browsers, the feature queries. If you don't know what a feature query is and you write code, that's something you're going to want to learn so that you can you just run a little test right in your CSS. If Grid is supported, do these things. If it's not, then do these other things. Um, I wrote a long article about how that works. It's linked to from this as well. So I know all the questions that you have about like real world realities. A lot of those the articles have been written and they're all linked to from here. Um, also, MDN has a really great guide, a whole set, both the documentation for each property and all the values, but also some just really good guides about how to get started with Grid, how to make sure that things are accessible. Don't screw up your accessibility. We're giving you superpowers. You can do lots of good. You can also do lots of harm. Please don't do harm. Your source order needs to be really great source order, and your layout needs to just be itself, and then you want your tabbing to still work. Um, so there's information about all of that in one of these guys is all about that. Um, I do think it's a time to explore. I think it's a time to really just mess around and see what happens. Um, Tinker Hatfield, a shoe designer for Nike, said, a basic design is functional. A great one will say something. I only think it's time for us to start to figure out how to make our layouts actually say something for us. Thanks. <laughs>